Well, good afternoon if you are in New York City or in Bogota, Colombia. Good morning if you're in places further west. Good evening if you are in Paris, London, Finland, Ukraine, of course, to whom we send our special love. Uh, greetings to people all around the world. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. As you well know by now, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. My guests today are two gentlemen who are brothers who I have wanted to have on for quite a long time. I admired them. Um, listeners know, regular listeners know that I don't have people on if I don't admire them unless I really have to tear into them. But these two fellows, I admire a lot. They are David Salazar and Francisco Salazar. And just so people can tell them apart, David, raise your hand. Francisco, raise your hand. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, they are the co-creators of a fantastic website called Opera Wire, which really covers the opera world more than any single newspaper does. There are opera magazines, of course, such as Opera News and Opera in the UK and Das Opernglas, for whom I write, and Opera International and many others. Um, but they are print magazines that come out and, and have criticism. They have an online presence. But David and Francisco have created Opera Wire, which really covers breaking news when it happens. Uh, they just told me this morning that I looks like I went offline. So I was saying that they covered the breaking news this morning of the sad death of Kaya Sariaho, the wonderful Finnish composer who wrote L'Amour de Luan and Innocence and many fine works. And um, But that's the point, is that they covered the news as news, not just as opinion and not just to reflect what may have happened in opera houses around the world, but what's happening in the opera world right now. Um, David and Francisco, you may know that I coined a term a long time ago, planet opera. In other words, a place where those of us who work in it or are deeply devoted to it, we occupy this space. And it's a different space from the planet Earth in that there are more gods than planet opera, number one. But number two, because we're all people who eventually meet and come to know one another or know about one another. So, for example, there are many singers with whom I've worked on a regular basis because my life trajectory and the contracts I get tend to correspond to theirs. There are other singers whom I greatly admire and conductors with whom I've never worked. I've never met them, although I've seen their work on stages. Similarly, they sometimes tell me that, you know, they would like to work with me and they know me and have seen my stuff, but have never met me. Um where you guys enter all this is that you are actually covering this. And so my first questions are a couple. Number one, uh, I know that Francisco is 34 and David is 35. And you divided the work so that David is editor in chief and Francisco is publisher. Who's the boss? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, Look, to be honest with you, I think that those titles are kind of, you know, I think they're more symbolic because I think that in, in the reality is that my brother and I, we kind of just divide and conquer, but we both, you know, play off each other. We both have individual strengths. We both have, you know, things that we know we can work on better. There's things that he's more interested in covering than I am and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, I mean, there are certain things that like, I've kind of taken control of, and there's things that he's taking control of, but the reality is I don't necessarily feel like there's a boss, I think. And, and to be honest with you, Fred, like Fran and I, our whole life, I mean, we're, we're less than a year apart in age. We've grown up together. We've been best friends. We've, 
you know, we played music together when we were teenagers. We make movies together as well. And we run opera wire together. So we've like our entire life, like we were, we were in an environment where we just work together and get along super well and just understand each other. And there really isn't kind of this rivalry between us. There isn't kind of this, like, I need to have the control vice versa that doesn't exist in our dynamic and has never existed to be honest with you so yeah i don't know if i i don't know that there's a boss you know i don't know if there's anything you want well to i'm start. glad for that and i understand about working in a cooperative situation but what if an editorial decision has to be made and you differ i'll give you an example i just wrote a book with the travel writer rick steves rick is a wonderful man a very famous travel writer i have my niche audience um I admire him. We agree on most things, but editorially, occasionally we would disagree. And the way we worked it out is we would use the term I or we when it was the collective voice of the right. book. When there was a difference, we would say one of the writers thinks this and the other writer thinks that. And if it's really an important difference, we'll say Rick thinks this and Fred thinks that so that the reader can make their own informed decision about that. But this is about um, food and wine and travel in Italy. But in your case, you're covering both things that require opinion, such as was the performance good, and news and facts, such as the unfortunate passing of a famous composer or singer, or um, that a particular company has signed a contract with uh, its union so it will not have a strike. That's news coverage as opposed to, let's call it feature coverage. Right. When editorial decisions have to be taken that are news coverage, and you may not agree on the approach, what happens? Well, we've had, I mean, I think since we've started, I think we can all say that there have been a lot of very tough uh, news items happening in these past four or five years. Um, I think Dave and I, we talked about it originally when we were, when all of these things were happening. I think we started to really try to find a balance between trying to find the story on both sides of, uh, of, the, of, of it and trying to create a, a balance so that it didn't feel like what everyone, what, what most news items was, was one side versus the other. So we try to find as much fact as possible, sometimes very hard. And sometimes, uh, sometimes like, for example, I don't agree with something. So I say, okay, let's contact, let's contact so-and-so and see if they respond. And based on that, uh, and if no response, then we, we, we go ahead with what, what, what is there. But we try to find a balance when we're trying to cover particularly very serious topics that can be sometimes, you know, quote unquote, contra well, controversial. Um, and we try to we, we try to make it so that everybody has an even hand in it. It's not always easy. Um, I know we've kind of maybe disagreed a couple of times on so and so, but I think you know, with those with those items, we try to we try to find a balance there. And for reviews, I think we've we've kind of had um, there have been some some times where uh, we we disagree where where we've been reading reviews from other people, and we we've had to talk about with our with our writers and we've had to talk, this is doesn't belong and why it doesn't belong or how we can um, make it so that it doesn't, it's, it doesn't feel like, like you're attacking an artist or it's compared, we don't, for example, one of the rules that we put in from the beginning was nobody is gonna be compared to any artist from the past, none of that. We don't, we're not interested in any of, in any of that. We're interested in the now and the present. And if you wanna re review an, an artist from the past, go to a recording and you can review that recording that's being remastered or whatnot. So that's something that we've we've always tried to, to strike a balance and try to find a way. But to add to that a little bit, Fred, um, so yeah, let's say we have a difficult situation. How do we frame story? How do we, usually when my brother and I have had disagreements over that, we spend a lot of time talking about it. And, you know, we, we, uh, we do allow each other to lay out one another's arguments. Um, and then we have to kind of make that decision based on, you know, consistency with other coverage of that topic right um and also like you know what's our precedent what have we done in the past how are we going to do this you know what's the framing here and what's the you know the benefit or the, the sometimes it comes some you know it really depends there's a lot of context around it too sometimes it comes comes down to like my brother said like we need more information so we need to wait on a quote we need to wait on something so that we can really feel that the story is solid 
Sometimes uh, it's something about how we title it, right? Because the titling is the framing of the entire thing. And those are conversations that, you know, we spend a lot of time with a lot of those decisions. Some of them at this point, I think, because we've been doing this for six years now, we kind of have a sense of, okay, this is how we're going to approach this. But especially, you know, like my brother said, when there's, when, you know, we had a lot of major, I mean, it keeps happening all the time. Right. But, um, you know, when you have certain topics, you have to treat them with respect and a lot of extra care, um, because of the readership, because of the audience, you have to, you have to be very mindful of that. Uh, you know, we've, we, we definitely spend a lot of time talking and discussing. And look, at this point in time, I think my brother are, like I said, we, we make films together. And in the decision-making of making a movie, uh, you're sitting in front of, you know, you're working with a massive team. Time is against you always. People are looking to you make to make a million decisions at the same time. Uh, usually, we, we, we bounce off each other. And we will discuss what works, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And... I know it's a cliche, but usually between our dynamic, the best idea wins. Or in this case, in the case of editorial, the most logical uh, and respectful and careful one usually wins out as well. I also so, think at, yeah. at this at this point, we're also we're also very you know we try to like I said we try to be unbiased uh, to everything that we write, and we also know that no matter what we write, how how the decision that we make. We also know not everybody's going to be happy with that decision. So we try to make the best decision for what works for our company, who we are and what we've, what we've done by now. And if something, uh, and if it doesn't make people happy, we know very well because our audience has grown very big that it's impossible to make everybody happy. And in the opera just... world, everyone has diverse opinions <laughs> anyways, right? Of course. No. So both you and I, both of you and I are speaking in a very specific context, which is to say that we are in the New York City area. And I believe one of you or maybe both of you went to journalism school. I went to journalism school. Yes. My background is in opera and the arts. When I say background, I mean my undergraduate studies and most of my working career. I made the decision a very long time ago that with very few exceptions, I would not write reviews because I cannot be expected to review someone I've worked with or may work with or never worked with when I would say that this artist maybe should not sing Mimi anymore because she's 72 years old or whatever. But I don't even want my mindset to be in that vein. So that's a choice I made. I'm not saying that you should make it, but my question is the following. Given that we live in the New York area and went to American journalism schools, we were trained in a certain kind of concept of objectivity, of news coverage, about checking facts, having sources, not being a website that or a print publication that engages in gossip or slander, um, different nations have different laws. Because we are New York based, I for I Dodger, which is a German company, you for Opera Wire, which I assume is an American company. Um, when things are digital, they go all around the world. And the assumptions and the laws that are active in these different countries are very different. So just the United Kingdom has a very different set of laws about what's liable what can be said, who can be photographed, fact-checking, all of that is very, very different. Do both of you work in the, I would call it, more defined American journalistic legal concept? Or do you think worldwide? And do you think about the fact that if one of your articles is picked up in Italy, um, it may be interpreted differently because the Italians interpret differently. Very simply, I once published an article in the United States and Corriere della Sera, Milan's newspaper, their journalist read it and she sort of transcribed it into Italian, but without the nuance. And it caused a mini scandal in Milan where I was accused of saying things I really didn't say. Um, not about the Milanese, but about the New Yorkers. And... So what are your guidelines for yourselves in terms of if you had a, a, a rule book? Oof. Well, I mean, yeah, go ahead. 
Well, I, I, I have to say I'm not trained as a journalist. I didn't go to journalism school. I trained, I, I learned on the, on the job. I learned uh, through Dave and I learned from working with another company called Latin Post. And that's how I kind of figured out what the AP style was. I kind of figured out what was correct journalism. And then I also worked for another Latin magazine um, a few years back as well. So Remezcla. So I, I kind of learned on, 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 the, on the job. Um, you know, our articles have been shared worldwide. We have been quoted by Corrida de la Sera. We've been quoted by Beckmester. We've been quoted by Platea. Um, I've also worked in hand with um, Opera, I think it's uh, Opera Actual in Spain. So I, I do know their work. I also read, I, I read all of these, these magazines daily and that's how I can figure out what, what's also happening around the world. And that's how we can get all, also our information because you know, there's so many opera houses in the world. So I try to, I mean, I try to, I guess when we're writing an article, we always try to go towards what, what's happening uh, t towards the way that America or the United States writes because it's how I, I have been trained in the way it is. Um, but that being said, I mean, I, I, I that being said, I, I also read very, like if there's like a very, there's something that's happening around the world that is uh, that's been written in Spain. I also try to see if it's written in 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 France, if it's written in in England, if it's written in America, and that way I can kind of figure out how to write the story um, uh, because it is because opera is such a worldwide um, a th worldwide <laughs> genre, I guess you can say yeah. art form genre <laughs> art form. So you you. Uh, so a lot of a lot of there's a lot of moving a lot of moving pieces are happening, um, and so I try to I, I try to combine from different sources to try to find the most the, the most true of this for the story. Yeah, that's I I think that's pretty much the gist of it. But yeah, we we try especially with you know fact and fact based pieces. Um, you know we're particular about like seeing, like my brother said, seeing how it's been covered, especially international stories, right? Because there's a lot of stories that a lot of the information is coming to us. We have access. We have a lot of access to the companies, to their press departments, to artists. So we do have a lot of access that we can verify a lot of the things that we're putting out there. When there is a bigger story that has an international bent, uh, and that's usually my brother who's covering that stuff. He, like he said, he's looking at how it's been covered in other places to see kind of what the parameters are uh, to make sure that we're kind of, you know, this is how this organization reported. And, and my brother kind of already also has the pattern and understanding of how some of these languages, international languages speak. So, and what they can have and how they, how they approach things. So, you know, that's kind of, yeah, I'm the one that's trained in journalism. I kind of have more of the American purview in terms of how we have to approach it. But obviously, like my brother said, this is an international, we reach international audiences. We have a very international readership, so we're constantly like seeing how international publications are also framing things, so that we're 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 able to kind of fit within that. Because you are an online, I'll call it publication, um, media outlet, as opposed to something in print. In print, uh, number one, you have to understand that you only have a limited amount of space and paper and so on. Whereas online, you can kind of expand exponentially to include whatever it is you want to include if you have the time to do it. Um, I'm going to get into the finances later about how you support this. But an earlier question is, you are both still quite young and you founded this six years ago. How did the idea come about and then how did you make it happen? Um, the idea came uh, out of, I, I would like, I, well, I, my brother and I worked for this online journal when we graduated from uni university. It was called Latin Post. And um, I we started working. Uh, my brother did sports, movies, and um, opera, or more like he started with sports and, and uh, movies. And I came in and I did movies. I was solely based on movies, doing reviews and interviews and reports on what was going on in the in the film industry. And then you know, it was Latin based and there's a lot of Latin American singers. And my brother went to the boss, went to our boss and said, can we start covering opera? And so we started doing reviews of the Metropolitan Opera and lo and behold, we started meeting a lot of different people in the opera world. Um, and in 2016, uh, that company went under and my brother and I were left without a job. We were working right now, we were working on our, our film projects, but we didn't have a, a stable income at that moment. 
to to support ourselves. So uh, my dad, uh, he said he said to us, you should build an opera website, and we were like, kind of, uh, we we weren't sure about the the idea. Um, but we had the we had all the, we had PR people that we had already contacted and we had contacts with the Met and this and that. So it was a it was a good way. Kind of, we already had that those established. So I think it was like a week or two. It was like a month. We planned. We said, okay, we're gonna do this section, that section, reviews, interviews, and uh, we launched on December fourth, two thousand sixteen. Um, really quickly, uh, not knowing what we were getting to. My brother had said, I don't know if we're going to have content for this website. <laughs> um, and I said, well, well, we'll try it out. We'll see. I mean, we start our first interview, actually. Uh, we contacted and uh, we contacted, I think it was 21C, and they were the first people to say, definitely. They gave us an, our first interview was with Susan Graham. It was a great way to start. Um, you know, it was a great endorsement. Um, and I still there, have not been able to interview Susan Graham. I've tried. <laughs> yes. That that was one of the greatest experiences ever. It was the first interview that, that we got. <laughs> and then we started kind of like slowly building the website. Our, um, and I remember our first follower um, on Twitter was Desiree Rancantore. Sicilian um, soprano. Yep. Yep. So I mean, so I, I remember these things because I, I I just remember how we slowly built it and how we slowly kind of like grew, 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 and all of a sudden it kind of exploded. And I mean, it's kind of grown, grown, grown. I mean, this year has been a whirlwind. Last year was, I mean, it's been, it, yeah. Every this year, year is quite, more of a whirlwind than the year before. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So, so it, right at the beginning, you created a feature called Artist of the Week, and your first one was Patricia Rossette. Correct. Doing Zalame. Yes. Who had the idea to create Artist of the Week, and how do you select the Artist of the Week? Um, that's me. That was my creation. Um, you know, I look at what's going. I, I I look at what's going on in the world, and I kind of like try to. Um, uh, to select based on like role debuts or house debuts. Um, it was an idea to spotlight an artist. Uh, Patricia Rochette obviously was well known back then. It was, it was kind of like to spotlight an artist who was like kind of a rising star, but we've also done like uh, big stars. And it's kind of like gotten to a point where I select based on like a, a, a role debut, a house debut, some something important for that singer. Um, I go, I, I, I look through opera base. Um, every week and see what's going on in the week. Explain and what, what, what are... opera bass is to people who don't know. Dave can explain. Sure, opera okay. bass is a, a database that kind of, you know, kind of encapsulates most most of the art, or basically all of the art, I don't know if all of the artists, but most of the artists in the opera world, opera companies, uh, and just kind of lets you, it's a nice database for letting you know what they've done, what they're doing, uh, what companies are scheduled to present. I mean, it, it is really, really excellent kind of just to get a sense of what artists have done or what they're doing. Um, it, yeah, it's a fantastic database. And, and how so, is the name Opera Wire chosen? <laughs> I have a paper actually where uh, where we have a bunch of names that we had a uh, um, we had looked we had we had we had tried out. I don't remember. I can't remember right now which ones, but I I remember that we kind of like uh, started writing a bunch of names with Opera at the beginning and. It just that was the one that fit the most, and we really kind of. I mean, liked I have it. to say, I have to say that uh, there's a publication called IndieWire, which specializes mm -hmm. in film, and it's amazing, and we love it, and we've always loved it, and we were just kind of like it. there, and we're like, well, why not Opera Wire? You know, does that exist? And uh, we didn't see anything called Opera Wire online, so we were like, well, why not? It kind of has a nice sound to it, you know. So yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, we kind of, we kind of took it. We're inspired by something that we really love, which is yeah. the film website IndieWire. So, yeah. So the next question is logistical. You were in your 20s. You were brothers. You were well-presented, well-spoken, well-credentialed. But you were kind of new. And when I met you guys <laughs> probably five years ago, I'm friendly and welcoming and not particularly competitive. So I just tried to make you at home in, in, on Planet Opera. But not everyone does that. And there are a lot of people in our particular plantation on the planet 
who are very hostile and competitive <laughs> and not necessarily welcoming. Some are, are welcoming. Um, and how did you professionally gain a toehold? And how did you start, for example, getting opera companies to put you on their lists? Because it, uh, press releases, I understand. So when recently Gustavo Dudamel left the Paris Opera, I'm sure at the same moment you and I got the same announcement yep. in French and in English. But um, that's different from every person who fancies him or herself or themselves as an opera writer and has a website or has a blog, thinks that they're entitled to get seats at the Paris Opera, the Metropolitan Opera, or La Scala automatically. There is that difference. And how, uh, you fellows, I see you at the opera, so I know that you are attending and admitted and so forth. But how did you make that transition into gaining acceptance and, and credibility when it's not easy and, and many tens of thousands of people try to do it. Yeah. Well, go ahead, friend. Yeah. I uh, know you. <laughs> well, I mean, like I was saying before, we had already the contact. We had done reviews for our, our early publication, Latin Post. Latin Dave had Post. started those reviews. So those were, they already, the press office already had known us. We had done interviews with singers like Eileen Perez, and, and I had done an interview with Anita Rashvilishvili. I had, we had done interviews with, with uh, with a lot of big stars at at the publication, so they had already they already knew who we were, kind of. So we weren't necessarily quote unquote new. The publication was new, so we had to we had to break in with big with, with something big. Our first review was a, a recording of Manon Lescott. Our first interview was with uh, Susan Graham. We were we were lucky enough that Lenny Studios was also very welcoming with to us and that um Lenny studio we, which has a connection to i dodge show just in full yes. disclosure yes, yes. okay <laughs> they, were, they were also very very gracious with us we were able to also do an interview with brian jade at that moment and they also kind of gave us a lot of our firsts and we also looked outside i remember i did two interviews with amore opera and we our, our goal was also to bring smaller opera companies in so that we could also bring in that group of people and not necessarily say, okay, we're only going to do this. Spotlight a more diverse group of opera companies. And I think that that's kind of, I think that's in many ways, like when you go after the big fish, like the Met, Chicago, San Francisco, Paris, London, whatever, like, I'm not going to say that it was easy with those. Uh, the Met, we were already there. I think with some of the other companies um, at the beginning, but some of them, some of them were skeptical, I'm not going to lie, especially in Europe, because, you know, you're two American guys writing this publication. Um, you know, it's a different it's a different environment, it's a different uh, publication situation there, too. Right. Because in the U.S., it's you know, there's there are there are a lot of publications. But I think in Europe, there's there's kind of a bigger volume or much more recognized publications. Um, so for us. Uh, I think coming, going to more into the indie opera scene, kind of the more grassroots approach that brought in a lot of, uh, I think that kind of helped us grow a lot more than, than I anticipated because I'm like, my brother said, I, I had no idea that the, that existed. Like I had no idea that, that, that we're going to have enough content to supply a week, you know, worth of readership. You know, I didn't think that that was going to be possible because I didn't really realize that there was so much opera happening around us. So when suddenly we start seeing this, now those companies, we start making those connections and those are the first companies that are like, hey, like here's some press releases. Can you interview this artist? Can you come and attend these performances? And you initially like, you know, we don't have, we're kind of building. We don't, we have a lot of time. We don't like, you know, there's not else, not a lot happening for us. So we were able to kind of bring in those companies and that give us the ability to like build and to grow. And that way it kind of opened doors to other venues other way suddenly i could go to the paris opera and say hey listen this is who i am this is what i've reviewed here are some uh you know clips of what i've done here's opera wire and this is what we've done and this is our readership and these are our numbers and then suddenly those opera companies are like oh welcome come um but yeah it was a gradual process and but you know there's also a lot of people i realize there's a lot of um you know, because yeah, you're right. We do live on Planet Opera, but Planet Opera is very isolated from the rest of the planet in many respects. You know, and a lot of the, the opera companies really do want people to know more about Planet Opera, and so they they're looking for for publications to kind of help them do that. So, 
So I, I just have a question that I've never thought about before. I've been saying Planet Opera for decades. I wonder if Planet Opera has moons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, we don't, have to, <laughs> we don't have to answer that now. Yeah. Um, Francisco, you mentioned two names, and since you mentioned them and I didn't know you were going to do that, I'm going to pick up on them. Eileen Perez and Brian Jade, the soprano mm -hmm. and a tenor. Um, many Adagio listeners know that one component of Adagio <laughs> is interactive education. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm teaching a course on Puccini that I began yesterday uh, with a wonderful musicologist director named Vivian Hewitt, who lives in Lucca and has devoted her life to Puccini. And next week I have Eileen Perez and Brian Jade will be talking about Bohem, Tosca, and Madama Butterfly. And people who want to sign up for this can participate and interact with me and with the artists. Um, it will be at 2 p.m. next Thursday, the 8th. So that's 8 p.m. in Luca, Italy. And you go to idadjo.com. Anyway, that's a little commercial because you said those names. <laughs> but... Um, one of the many things I find impressive about Opera Wire is that simultaneously on a page, you'll see the latest announcement from Opera in the Ozarks, which is sort of Missouri, Arkansas. And then right next to that, an announcement of something in Japan. And right next to that, an announcement of something happening in a small company in Poland. And I've used your search engine, which works very well. I'm very impressed with that search engine. But let's say that someone in Poland wants to look up what's on in Poland. Would they enter Poland or opera? Have you made that work so that people can find, you know, if they're in Arkansas, they may not want to know what's playing in Poland at the moment and vice versa. I mean, we have a tag system. Um, yeah. I'm not quite sure. Uh I mean, that's a great question yep. and something something to consider for sure, actually, as we continue to build. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think mainly the tag system has kind of been very, very geared toward, you know, opera specific topics or tags, right? Like names of composers, names of operas, companies themselves, uh, you know, specific artists names. So I think that, um, but actually, you know, like, I think that uh, you just gave me a really good idea for how we need to kind of move forward with some things. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, I don't know about, I don't know specifically if the way our engine or the way that we've built the engine with the tags, uh, if country specific or city specific things, I think some of them, some of the bigger cities, yes, but I think that country wise, maybe we could probably, that's some, that's an area for improvement. So thank you. Okay, sure. Um so on your web page, which is a very clean, visible web page, which is also a very nice thing. That's um, Lenny Studio, by the way. It, oh, good. It says <laughs> Opera Wire, and then it says News, Indie Opera, Reviews, Interviews, Special Features, Opera Wiki, Opera Quiz. And then among the special features are Artist of the Week. And this week it sells Evandon Haver, the wonderful South African soprano. Uh, on this day, Opera Meets Film and Puzzles. <laughs> and that's a lot to maintain. Yeah. How do you two, I mean, literally, physically, in terms of time, in terms of energy, um, you are a two-man team. I know that you farm out articles to writers, but you still are basically publisher and editor-in-chief. So a couple of those things, um, like you, you pointed out, some mm -hmm. of them, unfortunately, we just haven't been able to maintain long term, like the opera, like the quizzes in the, in the games, unfortunately, as fun as they are, they also take up time to do. Yeah. So that's something that we've kind of put on the back burner for the moment, because a lot of the other content and other responsibilities with the publication have just really taken over our lives. And yes, we we are, you know, we have a staple of writers that are kind of, you know, here with us on a part time basis to kind of work through some of the articles some of the shorter articles we have our writers internationally that kind of do more of the the reviews on that and then help with interviews um but yeah i mean my brother and i it is it is a really daunting task and, and it is very very intense and um i mean i think if we didn't love it as much as we did i don't think we'd be able to keep up with it it is a very it is time consuming but i think we've kind of developed a system between ourselves to kind of figure out how we can be most efficient um, and how we can kind of figure out what to prioritize 
and what because I think at the beginning at the beginning our we were kind of obsessed with our inboxes being at zero and not having like getting every single <laughs> piece of news out and done. Mm -hmm. And I think after a while, you after fighting that fight for like months, I think you come to the realization that you're just never going to catch up. So I think I think it's just we ourselves have had a lot of conversations about you know how much you know when it's okay to not have to just go go constantly to that you know to where are the limits right it's okay to have them it's okay to understand them it's okay to say you know what friend like uh today he was telling me there was like uh five companies announced their new seasons and uh i have two season announcements in my inbox oh that's seven uh throw me like three or four and i'll figure it out by the end of the weekend but you know you have to kind of just figure out how you manage that workload uh, so that you don't burn yourself out and so that it's still fun and exciting to make the discoveries right to because that's what it is you're kind of discovering the opera world as the news rolls in you're kind of discovering new things about new artists about you know yeah i mean that's that's where the magic is and so i think for us yeah we've had to make some decisions about like for example the opera meets film feature is something that i was i'm very passionate about i'm a filmmaker uh it's something that i that i started and i did it on a weekly basis for a long time but it was also really intense. It was also really hard to keep up. And so I came to a point where I started doing it only once a month. And now we have a writer that that's specifically dedicated to that because I just realized that I couldn't manage it anymore. And I had to put my focus on a lot of other things. So I have someone else that's super passionate about it. And once a month, he puts in an opera meets film feature that John Vanderbilt is the writer and he's doing a really great job. And he brings a different perspective than I would. Um, he's a musicologist. So he brings a very different approach to how film and music intertwine than me as a filmmaker would right but um you know it's just about figuring out ways to kind of manage that um and figuring out what i can and what i can't do same with my brother right and and so what we've realized and and like i said we have we're, we're, the company's growing and that's allowed us to kind of bring in people to be more more fixtures of the organization and kind of help us and take on more responsibilities and you know sometimes that means okay well now you know, in the past, uh, the Met has 25 operas in a season, and me and my brother would divide that between us, and we'd do all of them. Well, now I don't have to do that anymore. Now my brother and I can take 10 between us, and, and the other writers can take other stuff that we've covered in the past, and maybe also, because at the same time, the people that are that are doing this with us, they love opera. They're passionate about opera. For them, this is exciting to be able to go and cover a performance and write about it. So you also want to give them that experience, and that's that's, I think, what's been able to help us. So the, as the company's been able to grow, we've been able to bring in a really cool team of people to kind of just help us build. Yes. Okay, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, for example, like Sorry, I do my moment. artist, I do the artist of the week uh, weekly. There's a, been a couple of times that I, I miss because I'm doing, I don't know, I have a bunch of things that are just going on. Um, but I try to spotlight a different artist every single week. Um, sometimes I've repeated, sometimes I've tried to keep it fresh. It's always, always interesting just to see what artists are doing and going to different houses and looking through. But like my brother was saying, like this year, I didn't do as many Met reviews, but I went to Parma. I went to the Teatro Radio di Parma and I did the Verdi Festival. So that was a lot of fun. I, I, I'm going to, to Italy in a, in a few weeks and I'm gonna go do two reviews there. So that's also kind of enjoyable and fun. And so we can, give the rest like the what what other writers are interested in doing then you give it to them like i wanted to do a, i don't know it was a performance of i wanted to do the review for lisa de more the second cast but one of our writers wanted to do it i said you know go do it i've already done one review so you can you can go and enjoy yourself and go have fun and i went to see it on my own but it's it's just it's just trying to balance and find balance in that obviously there will always be some priorities there were, you know, un unfortunately, the, it, it, there's always going to be a hierarchy of of, of what you write about uh, first and what you what you don't, and that's always going to be the bigger houses, the bigger stars. If there's something always happening with them, those will always take. I don't want to say priority, but they're they're always going to be uh, what we what we write about first. I mean, like before. look, Kaya Saraya's the news about her today. That wasn't something that we knew. We needed to yeah. get published as soon as possible, you know, yeah, and that's that was like I said, I drop everything and go for that, you know, and then the yeah. stuff that you drop, we'll figure it out later, you know, and, and we have to, you kind of have to, but uh, yeah, sorry. But we try to cover, we, but we try to, we try to be fair to everyone and we try to give them as much, give, give the, 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 all of the, all of what they give us, we try to give 
them the fair the, the fairness of, of having something out there for them because it's a, it's important to show that there is a diversity in an opera uh, in regional in, in in the bigger in the small in the, the the lesser known artists but it's always important to give them the same exact exact importance as you do to the big stars the big houses because that's who we were built on that's it's how we built the company out. Yeah. So for listeners who are listening to the three of us talk now, I want you to envision either a newspaper or a magazine, in other words, something in print, where you can turn the page and it may be indicated for you that something is a review or something might be a news story, such as um, an artist leaving a company, such as decline in ticket sales, such as the signing of a union contract. You, can, you listener, can usually tell when it's an opinion and when it's not an opinion. On the screen, whether you're looking at your phone, whether you're looking at a computer, those distinctions are not always as immediate and recognizable, even if the people who run the website try to make that clear to you by having a column such as reviews or news. Um, one of the challenges I face, and you mentioned Elisir de Mores, so I'm going to address that. I went to the opening with the first cast, which was very fine, but I also got myself a ticket to the opening with the second cast, which featured the Spanish tenor Xavier Anduaga, who has a terrific reputation in Europe. It was his Met debut. Um, the conductor is the excellent Michele Gamba, who really has made a lot with this work and He's featured mm -hmm. prominently in La Scala's upcoming season, so they think a lot of him. I had every reason to believe that this was going to be a night that would attract audiences. So I was really disheartened when I sat down in my subscription seat and there were seven people in my section and I posted a picture of that on, on social media, not to attack the Met, because I love the Met and I love opera and I want it to thrive. But to ask rhetorically the question, why when we have this major debut of a popular opera with an excellent conductor who has already been well-reviewed and a wonderful cast around them, but specifically this debut, um, what's wrong with this picture? And well, I did that on social media. If I were to do it in one of my journalism outlets, um, I couldn't do it that way. I would have to posit the opinion about why, despite this excellent offering on the Met stage, that the audience seems not to be there. When you guys approach things that might be polemical, I don't mean nasty and gossipy. I just mean why more people didn't turn out for that. Is it maybe that they're waiting for a review? Maybe they've seen Elisir de Morte. <clears throat> too many times maybe the ticket prices are too high who knows but those are the topics that one can approach when you fellows do this on opera wire <clears throat> sorry how do you make the distinction so that the reader will understand its news its opinion its coverage its perhaps polemics how do you do that well i did an editorial um just a year, a year ago, it was a very kind of polemic um, editorial, and I wrote immediately, it's an editorial. Um, I'm yeah, not, I, I, we wrote immediately, it's an editorial, and I, I wrote, this is, this is an opinion piece. Um, and and I, that was something that was important. I mean, we, had, we, 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 we have a writer also who right now is on a break, uh, who also did her uh, crit criticism on Fridays, and that was immediately known as a um, as an editorial. It was strictly opinion. It was never uh, is that. And review, every review has the title company year review. And from there, that's already strictly yeah. our opinion. That is That is how we feel. Anything else that is not an editorial or a review or an opinion is written as a straight article and always presented to it as a straight article. So-and-so has yeah. left the company. This is the statement of the company. This is what happened. Maybe this is what happened years ago. And this is how they, they attacked that same topic years ago. That's how we try to uh, uh, change it. I um, I also did, I remember a, a, a few, few years ago, a series called March Madness, 
uh, because they were showing Lucia. Um, and I and I strictly had my opinion on what I thought Lucia was. I remember I got a lot of criticism over it, but that was um, strictly my opinion. It was my editorial uh, um, opinions. It's like, for example, our uh, our, li our our listicle for the end of the year, our best artists of the year. Those are strictly Opera Wire's opinions on who we feel are. I think to we be try to introduce it as such too in the voice of the yeah. pieces. Um, but yeah, like the topic that you brought up, I mean, there's many times where, um, you know, I've gone to the Met and there's an incredible cast and it's empty and it's, you know, it's sad. And I'll try and find a way to put it into the review just so people, you know, who read the review are understanding of what's going on, you know? Um, yeah, I, I think mean, also, I think a review of Elisir D'Amore also said that at the end of the review because uh, because our writer, Logan Martel, he he was also shocked to see the Met as well that empty for that those performances, and I went afterwards and the, my performance is also equally and I, I I talked about it. I mean, you know, I'm it, uh, we talked about it and we talked about it with Logan as well. Should we, how should we frame it? And it, it was just something that was important to mention because, like, you know, I mean, for us, yeah, like an important debut like that it was it was very shocking. But I mean, we we try to frame it in review editorial type of way so that people know this is how we how we're framing it yep so now i'm going to ask both of your opinions on something it relates sure why i, I mean when i worked at the met and before that la scala and other companies since then <laughs> in that era yes we had many famous stars who were stars and they had followings there was also recording companies who would put out the recordings of these stars. And there were newspapers that covered every debut. So when Aprile Mila made a jump in debut um, and was great, it was covered. It made the news. Nowadays, um, you don't see that as much in mainstream print media. And therefore, I think that there's less of a following of artists. Um, I and you who read widely in European opera media knew about Xavier Anduaga and perhaps heard him on YouTube videos and whatever, but it's not the same as having a following. Opera companies don't necessarily want to pin their hopes on one singer because if that singer gets sick, cancels, gets COVID in the case of Angela, Angela Giorgio recently, um, suddenly there's a disappointment. And so I understand what they're juggling here. And I understand that if Diva A wants his coverage and Diva B wants the same coverage, it's a problem. But mm. I'm, what do you think changed that a mid audience, which is sophisticated, would not have known about Xavier Anduaga when he's a big sensation in Europe? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, I saw him, I actually saw him in Bergamo a few years ago, in 2019, he did an amazing Lucrezia Borgia, and I remember that after that Lucrezia Borgia said, this is, here's a star coming, and then I saw him last summer in uh, in San Carlo, in uh, in Barbara Seville. Yeah. You know, in, in the case of that, I think, you know, it's very hard to say what what companies are thinking and how they how they're trying to promote their their artists but you do see that certain artists are pushed over other artists and for me that's always very disheartening you know i think one of the best stars that the met currently has is alexandra kurzak she did two fantastic productions this past past uh, year and i don't see the same coverage that she gets from another singer and Xavier Anduaga this is a big debut i expected a big interview on the new york times or something something other and there was nothing to be said and here's this artist who in in, in spain and in, in europe is really being pushed up um ever since he won operalia i mean i i have only heard wonders and i and i got to see him it went in in this in this other role and i don't know i mean i think it's very hard to really say what opera companies are are but i do see in the case of i'll say the met because this is the one i follow i i see that certain artists are pushed high up and then other artists they're not they don't they don't get the same attention and certain artists are pushed high up and then all of a sudden they they start they stop getting attention and they replace them another when they're constantly consistently doing the same 
good work and sometimes even better work than, than you would expect of another person getting the same I, coverage. So I actually want to ask you the question, Fred, because yes. you, you've probably seen the, you, I mean, you know, we started really seriously going to the opera in the two thousands. We've been in, we were in the nineties, but I want to know what, what the transition or what you've seen culturally that shifted over the last few decades. Well, then. um, I have now been working in opera young though I look for 51 years because I began when I was 16 oh, wow. at the Lyric Opera of Chicago was my first professional job. And so at that time, I was working with the Geddes, the Gobies, the Franies, the Verrettes, um, people like that, Alfredo Krauss very often. And these were experienced artists who, in the case of Gobi, went back to the 40s. And he was able to instill in me knowledge and experience and so on that I try to pass along now. Part of my job, and it will be part of your job since you get older, is this passing along of what we innately know and have learned. Um, I think a big part of the problem, well, Artis Kranich, who was the general director at the Lyric Opera of Chicago when I was there, had a philosophy that 75% of what you present on the stage should be let's call it meat and potatoes the classics the you know the lohengrin and faust and bohem and notes di figaro and so on the other 25 percent should be divided one of them should be a lesser known work ready for rediscovery and say carabini's medea and the other one should be a new opera and she at the very beginning believed in new and contemporary opera when other companies in America, except for Houston, were really not promoting it that much. Um, the Met has come a long way in terms of presenting contemporary opera, but now they're presenting a lot of it. And I don't think audiences want just that. And I'm not saying that they need to follow artists at 75, 25, that they want to do 66, 33, fine. But people who are new to opera don't only want contemporary opera. And they want to understand, I mean, you know, if I'm learning to cook, I have to learn how to break an egg before I learn how to cook an egg. So mm -hmm. you break the egg with Monteverdi and Handel and Mozart, and you learn the foundations of opera, whether you work in it or whether you're attending, whether you go twice a year, whether you go twice a week. And the result is that it becomes part of your life and your routine. The other thing that's a major difference is that there was the tradition of subscribing, that you had a preferred seat because tickets were hard to get. Uh, when I worked at the Met in the 80s, um, we would basically print our season program and just sell it. And subscribers would come and, you know, yes, Votsek and Lulu may not be completely sold out. But um, if you had an important artist in one of those operas, Hildegard Behrens, let's say, in Wozzeck, um, that would bring in more people because it was Hildegard Behrens. And that's the other thing, that audiences, whether it's baseball, whether it's ballet, whether it's cinema, follow people who inspire them. And, you know, if exactly. Christine Gerke or Carita Matila or Bryn Turvel, just to name three, are appearing somewhere, I want to see them. Thomas Hampson, there, there's a number who I will go just because it is who they are and what they do, whether I know them personally or not. And yes, in that era, there was Pavarotti, Domingo, Carreras, Krauss, Vickers, just to name tenors, Bergonzi, were all appearing on the stages all the time. And that was just the first few names among the tenors. You had Verrett, Bunbury, Norman, Price, Arroyo, um, Milo, Tikanova, Sutherland, Gruberova, on and on and on and on and on. So what we would do is we would go hear three Lucias with three different women to compare <laughs> how Sutherland versus Gruberova versus June Anderson would do in a particular <laughs> production of the role. Then we would want to see different productions to study the approach of the stage director and the designers to how they approach Lucia. So Francesca Zambello's production might be different from uh, someone else's production. And we followed this because we cared. 
And I still follow baseball that way. But um, people have to know what their passions are. Yeah. And I have a feeling, it's just my opinion, that opera has been marketed to a fairly well without acknowledging that passion and sex and politics and religion are at the core of what opera is. And, and I was going to try to erase that or neutralize it or I'll get in trouble for this, make it politically correct to appeal to every single audience. Um, you're neutralizing it. Part of what makes opera so important historically is that it has always been political and social and edgy mm -hmm. and technologically in the vanguard. And you want that. You want to be a part of that. And if you happen to agree or disagree on a topic with your friend, with your opera going friend, with your co work colleague, you it doesn't mean that you hate each other. It means that you engage in discussion and say, well, I believe that this tenor should not sing Otello for whatever reason. And there are endless discussions that we can have because we're immersed in it mm. and we care about it. We want to keep it healthy and vibrant. And this does not mean just doing the past, but making operas in the past. I believe George Schulte said that the scenery should look like what the music sounds like, which he gave mm. us a lot of room to explore mm. that because right. if the music sounds one way to you, you would create scenery that might be completely stark. Mm. Zeffirelli might make it Baroque. Um, but there's all of this stuff that goes into it. I also believe, and I know this is controversial, that projected titles of Dunop are no good or very little mm. good. And the reason for that, they came in at the Met around 1990, they came in at the City Opera in Toronto about 1980, is that it's turned the audience into passive readers. Mm. So I went to a production the other night at the Met, musically sensational. Um, I'll say it, The Flying Dutchman. Yes. That relies on people reading and not really listening and not engaging in the action. So therefore, the people kind of stood on the stage or they made gestures that really didn't make sense. Um, you had fabulous singers and actors on that stage that night. They were, I mean, Elsa yeah. Van den Haver, and I cannot pronounce his name, Thomas Konishevsky. He's amazing. And a great young conductor making his debut. And, but the production relied on us reading. And so many productions, not just at the Met, but everywhere, rely on us reading. And when we're reading, we're not listening. And when we're reading, we're not really looking at the action on the stage. It's what? not a foreign film with subtitles. It's a musical uh, event where the music tells the story first, the production second. And I always say that I consult the titles if it's an opera in Czech or Russian, which I don't speak. But if it's the other opera languages, I really try to see it as if I were watching it in Paris with Carmen in 1875 or... Um, Milan, 1842, Nabucco, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Leonardo City, Figaro, Vienna, 1786. And I try to do it that way. And we are such an analytical society. People who go to the opera tend to have some income, tend to be intellectually engaged, and therefore they analyze as they watch. And I always say, do not analyze, do not connect to the words, feel. Read the story ahead of time. Read the libretto if you want. Listen to the music ahead of time. But when you're in the theater, it's theater. It's not It's not a polemic to be analyzed in the moment. You watch it. You take it in completely. And then after, you see what has remained. So there. I had, I had, an, <laughs> I had an experience this in, in November. It was November. And I went to La Scala and I was sitting in uh, not great seats, but I was seeing Fedora for the first time. I ne I'd, I'd never heard a single thing. Um, and I remember just watching the, uh, just reading the, the summary before. And then I just watched the production and I was just blown away. I mean, the production was okay. It wasn't great, but I was just blown away by the singing and by the yeah. storytelling of the singers. And I, and, and that for me was, that's kind of like what I remember going to the opera for the first time. And so I try to, so when I'm approaching a new work, I try not to read the, the subtitles. I just try to watch what I'm, what I'm watching and listen and experience the music because otherwise I'm, I'm either reading or listening to the music and I, and I can't do, I can't so I'm do good, both. I'm so. going to push back a little bit. 
I am going oh, yeah. to push back a little bit. No, I understand where you're coming from, Fred. And, 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 and personally, I agree. But uh, just thinking about, um, you know, why. I, I do think that um, the idea is to engage a wider range of audience, right? You want to bring new people to the opera. And a lot of those people, you know, might not speak those languages. And yeah, of course, you want them to be in there. You want them to feel. But without the context... You know, and if they don't have it in the moment, they're trying to understand it. Um, you know, I think that the subtitles can be a good guide to kind of keep people engaged, right, with the story that's playing on stage. I do agree 100% that a lot of productions, um, especially at the Met, because I think in Europe there's a different movement in terms of that very idea where forget the subtitles, just watch the stage, right? So what, you're now in that case, you're watching instead of listening. You're, you're engaged, you're trained to watch and forget about the subtitles and just watch the story that the director has decided to tell you. In a lot of opera companies, not all of them, but a lot of European opera companies, you see that. Here at the Met, what's happened is that you're right. A lot of the productions are so reliant on the subtitles that the directors don't really do much with staging. And the characters like in The Flying Dutchman, which is one of my you know, one of the things that was very bothersome to me as an audience member is that, yeah, the characters feel one dimensional. The characters feel uh, just stale. The, the staging is static. And a lot of opportunities that could have been explored dramatically, emotionally, physically, visually are not taken advantage of. But at the same time, you know, I do realize that. And, and, and I say this because I've also had experience with people going to the opera with people that have never been to the opera. And of course they're blown away by the sonic experience of it. Because I think that's what really gets people that have never gone to the opera and especially at the Met. But at the same time, I do know that those people, for them it was very helpful to be able to understand what they were watching. Because I think some people, and again, this also comes to our cultural thing where our attention spans are so small now because we're used to kind of immediacy and opera takes its time. Music takes its time to develop, um, you know, it, once the initial power of the sound, you know, after a while, some of those people, they need context for that. Otherwise for them, it's just, they, they don't. And again, when you have a production that's not really doing much for you, yeah, you need something to kind of help you stay in the moment and to kind of understand what it is you're listening to, right? Um, because, and on, and also depends on an opera to opera basis, right? To some operas with the melodic qualities that, you know, that, that stuff might, might jump at you but if it's something a little more complex like Bozek or Lulu you know if you don't know German then yeah you're gonna need something to kind of to kind of help you and you're not an you're not an expert in atonal 12 tone music you need kind of something that you don't have to be an expert you have to be open you have to be non-judgmental I'm going to push back just a little bit sure in ancient times which is to say 1975 uh -huh. <laughs> I, I was a kid. I was a kid, but I mean, I was going to opera early. I was already working in opera. Um, we didn't have titles. And what we were trained to do and always did was if the opera began at eight o'clock, we didn't arrive at 755 and run to the bathroom. We arrived at 730. We were handed the program. We read the notes. We read the synopsis of the first act. That's all we needed. Because the storytelling was, if the production was good, uh, effective that way. But the storytelling is first in the music. Mm, when you go mm. to Madame Butterfly, you don't need the words. You just don't. You need to really listen and watch them act. Mm. And it is so moving and so effective. And, and Puccini, whom I'm immersed in now, as I mentioned, um, but, you know, I'm restudying all of his operas for this course. And wow, Madame Butterfly is just the one that knocks me out more than it ever did before. Because those are not experiences that I've had personally. And that's very important to say that it's not relevant if you've experienced it. Because I've never been, you know, captured by the Egyptian army. <laughs> all kinds right. of things in all the operas. I've never had a spell cast on me that I know of. I've never been in a blazing fire on, on, on a rock. You know, all that <laughs> stuff has not happened to me. But the humanity of the characters and their experiences are what we connect to. And the way we do that is first by knowing what's basically happening, not the dialogue, it's not a play, but then having the composer. I always say the composer 
read the libretto and he or she um, then created music that takes the words much further than the words themselves could ever go. So if you limit yourself to the words rather than the storytelling and the music plus the storytelling on the stage, um, you're really you're operating on, on a low burner. Um, and I do want to add one more thing that you were saying is that when I take someone new to the opera, the first thing I say, especially at the Met, is, you know, they're not amplified. What you're mm-hmm. going to hear is natural sound because listeners elsewhere, we're not being chauvinistic New Yorkers, but the Met does have better acoustics. And it's just a phenomenal experience mm-hmm. going to opera at the Met and hearing the orchestra and the chorus and the singers. Um, I'm not saying that other theaters don't have good acoustics. It is something remarkable to hear, like the other night, the Flying Dutchman at the Met. On musical terms, it was fabulous. And Agreed. therefore, Agreed. you know, just sitting, being immersed in that for two and a half hours, I'm getting goosebumps as I say it, hearing these great passionate singers with this excellent orchestra and chorus and a new young conductor who was making a splashy debut. Thomas, no, how do you pronounce his last name? Two guys, two guys, two guys, two guys, guys. Yeah. Um, who is going now to conduct the ring in place of Baron Boim and who's mm-hmm. taking over Frankfurt Opera. And, you know, we want to follow people like that. Yeah. And yeah. so the other debut conductor this year was Michele Gamba, who did all these fantastic things with Elisir D'Amore that we think we know that opera until we really listen. And then we realize what a masterpiece it is and not just a simple rustic comedy. And um, we want to actively listen. We want to actively engage. Um, This is something that opera asks of us to do, but nothing about the current opera going experience for the unprepared encourages them to do that. I agree. And, you know, you guys are young fellows and I've seen you respond at the opera while I was sitting next to one of you recently. I could tell how into it you were. Because... Because the Martin Albert Flutter, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was quite, it was to me a great, great production, Albert Flutter, which, by the way, tomorrow the Met is doing an HD around the world and worth watching. Um, I saw that production, and here's an example. I saw that production five years ago in Aix-en-Provence. Mm. And I kind of liked it, but then this time I really loved it. I didn't dislike it. I just didn't love it. This time I really loved it. And yes, changes were made. And yes, it was more indoors. And yes, it was a different cast. And yes, um, the World Cup was not being played the same day (laughs) with France in the final. And there were all kinds of conditions that were happening five years ago. And as it happened, I got sick that day and needed medical attention. All those reasons mean that I was not focused on the magic flute five years ago the way I was at the Met when I went twice now. Um, and this is another thing. We keep going back to operas that we love or think we know to learn more about them and more about ourselves. Mm. Um, you know, just the fact you were mentioning Fedora before. To me, Umberto Giordano, the composer, is one of the great undervalued composers. And I completely respond to his music. Fedora, the story is nothing much. Andrea Chenier is terrific. Siberia, Siberia, a little known opera, is terrific. And we, you know, it's kind of like if we read Edith Wharton and we like Ethan Frome, then we want to read The Age of Innocence and other books. Um, We go from one output to the next of the same author. Yeah. Opera is a lifetime passion. It's not something that we do twice a year on Friday nights for a hot date. We can do that, but if we're on a hot date to see Bohem and then Mimi dies, it's kind of like, it's a doubter. (laughs) I I do want to add something about, you know, discovering and rediscovering classics and music. I think one of the things that has really uh, fascinated me a lot about the festivals, like going to Parma, going to the Donizetti Festival, and even what Ricardo Chailly has been doing at the La Scala, is rediscovering some of the classic masterworks. And when I say rediscovering, it's not just showing the same editions that we see, it's, I don't know, I saw the original Simon Bocanegra, which I had never heard in my entire life. I didn't really love it, but I said, and but after seeing it, I said, oh my God, now I can appreciate what Verdi did afterwards and all of his revisions, because Verdi I now know. Loito. 
Verdi and Boito, yeah. Because the 1881 but, edition of the Council Chamber scene is what really made that opera a masterpiece. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I can I can now appreciate what they did. But I think one of the one of the things that I've always missed and I think lack at the Met, for example, seeing Elisir D'Amore, I say, you're going to do a new production. Perfect. Let's do a new production. So when we do that new production, let's rediscover the score as well, not just rediscover what we're putting on stage. Let's let's do a critical edition of L'Elysir d'Amore because what's the difference between 10 minutes cut than adding those 10 minutes in? Because as you said, for me, when I hear Donizetti opera, whether it's Lucia, whether it's L'Elysir d'Amore, which is Lucrezia Borgia, bel canto is written off as just, uh, you know, vocal fireworks, but it's not, for me, Donizetti is not vocal fireworks. For me, Donizetti oh. is, is, is powerful and, and is as dramatic as Verdi in, in many cases. Uh, I just heard that Lucia that they did at, at La Scala, and I was so happy that they got rid of the cadenza. I was so happy. I said, we don't need it. It's not necessary. The music is there. And I, I'll never forget going to one Lucia performance. It was in 2009, and it was the Trepco. Did, it, did not hit the high E flat. Nobody applauded. I said, what? Like, you, you're not listening to the music. You're only listening to vocal fireworks. For me, rediscovering... The music is 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 get is going to the core of the score. I don't care if I see another new production. I want to see, I want to see, I want to hear the music. And when I heard that they were bringing that 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 uh, uh, the critical edition of Lucia at the Met the, uh, here, and they were going to show it on display and blah blah blah. And Ricardo Fritza, who is an incredible Donizetti composer, I, a conductor, I thought, oh, yeah. he's going to bring the critical edition to the to the Met. And when I heard what they did, I said, well, I mean, I would have preferred to hear the critical edition to, to, than watch this because I, I got nothing from, from what I saw. There was no rediscovering of music. It was just the same old that we were seeing there. The same with the five act Don Carlo version. I wanted to see the five acts. I wanted to discover new music. The French version. And with the French version, I, I didn't want, I, I'm not interested in, for me, the music is at the core. And when you're doing a new production, that should be the first and foremost, not what you're seeing on stage. And that's how I think you also bring a new audience. I because, wanted to throw one last, I wanted to jump in there just because you talked about um, the programming philosophy. And I think that personally, and I think that, and I think this happens at a lot of big houses and I'm pretty sure that the business of opera has a lot to do with it because you're programming years in advance and you know, adapting to new trends or new changes is very difficult. But one thing that does occur to me is that if we are going to program new operas, we're going to put new operas on the stage because it's you're taking years to develop these. So you know what you're creating. It occurs to me that, and you were saying, Fred, about how did we get to a uh, fire shut up in my bones? How did we get to an Akhenaten? What's the lineage leading that? I think that themed based seasons where, because there's a lot of topics, a lot of operas are political. A lot of operas treat yeah. specific kinds of themes that are still modern and still relevant. That's why we still connect to them. I do think that that kind of approach that allows those new operas to have a context, to exist within a lineage where you can see the connection from the beginning to the end of the evolution. I think that would help a lot with also the messaging of how you market opera to a larger audience and say, this year at the Met, we're focusing on violence against marginalized people, for example, as a theme. I think you have a lot to play with across the history of opera. Uh, Those are 50 operas right there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there you go. Yeah. Well, I agree completely. And, and it's not new to have thematic seasons. Many companies have done that for years. Opera, um, the Flemish opera in Antwerp and Ghent did that for a long time. Um, but... I, I think that, well, I want to answer something that Francisco said, namely that why do they only do the last version of an opera? In the James Levine era of the Met, and maybe Yannick Nizay Sagan differs, and I'm fine if he does, but I just want you to know what Levine imposed. Because mm -hmm. you said this to me because we discussed it and I would disagree with him, but I would understand why he said that. He felt that it was important to put on the last version that the composer approved of, or in the case of Lulu, would have approved of, or Puccini with Turandot, um, 
where there are sketches left and we want to think that the sketches faithfully realize the vision of the dead composer. So that's why we would never see the first version of Macbeth, of Don Carlo, of Simone Bocanegra at the Met, or Fidelio. Because I always loved the Paul Gustav Mahler, Leonard Bernstein version of Fidelio, in which they insert Leonor Overture number three between the two scenes of the second act. And the reason for that, Mahler felt, and Bernstein agreed, and I agree with them, is that it was an awkward transition from the dungeon where Florestan is kept to the celebratory right. final scene. And that music provides a dramatic arc and it also gives a rest to the singers, but it provides a dramatic arc taking them from the darkness to the light. And Mahler said, this music is about going from the darkness to the light, but Levine wouldn't include that. And I understood that and I respected him. I just disagreed with him on that. And I think that there is room for movement as long as we don't, you know, Rossini borrowed from his own other operas and Don Vicente right. Cage did too. Um, there are many critical editions that by Alberto Zedda, by Philip Gossett, by Francesco Izzo now, who are doing wonderful work to try to establish a critical edition, but that is still their opinion, ultimately. Right. But even like Levine included that amazing prelude in Don Carlo, which you don't hear anywhere else. Right. And I, I mean, so there is, there. I think there is room for for rediscovering music, but rediscovering music where it's, it's, it's editions that abide to critical editions as opposed to like this French version of Don Carlo for me was, in my opinion, a gimmick because it didn't include the hall French French work the that we saw. Yeah. There was the a original couple of music. scenes that were very, were notably missing. Like were notably ending, missing. The ending so, trial scene or the the masks, switching of the masks. That's, I mean, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that I was looking forward to that when I actually went and heard it, I was like, well, yeah, the, was, the, the Posa Carlo duet is the one that Verdi originally composed and that's cool, but everything else is kind of more or less the same of the as the original, as the five act version that we've known to hear. So, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with my brother in that sense, too. I think that, and also this music is fluid. And again, this is kind of like, there are many versions of these things. It's not a film because film is crystallized, right? And even then you see filmmakers go back and re-edit and directors <laughs> cuts, and then they re-release five versions of Blade Runner. Like that's also, there's nothing like that's like set in stone. By with objects. It's also a living, breathing art form, right? There, And we're also constantly... You see a lot of versions of like Traviata has cuts that I don't think Verdi authorized necessarily or no. Rigoletto. Like there's cuts, right? And whether or not you want to agree that they work or they don't work, they're better with the cuts or without the cuts, but there's cuts. And we are we've used like certain standard versions that we're used to, but I think that there are there is room to kind of play with that. And I think it also I think a lot of it does depend on 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 stage directors because stage director is becoming a much well, I don't know if it, much more, but it's definitely a bigger presence in, in, in how we talk about opera. Mm -hmm. um, that is also it always has been, but the approaches were different. Right. And it was more in the German speaking world where that became a point of discussion, although American directors, British directors who take a more text approach uh, to the opera and the Italian directors who take a more visual musical approach. That could be for another time because there are two more topics I want to cover with both of you. And then we Do kind it. of have to say adios for today. Yeah. The first is my audience has clearly come to understand that both of you are very musical. And I know that David plays the violin and Francisco plays the cello. Yeah. And you both gave musical selections on the Adagio catalog that reflect your interest in, in your instrument. What was your musical upbringing? I know your family is from Bogota, Colombia. You grew up in New York. Um, talk about music and your family and how that informs your career choices now. Sure. So, well, my dad is has always been a passionate art and opera lover. And I know he did some vocal training when he was in Colombia. Um, you know, and at some point he had the ambition in the dream of potentially, you know, having a, a career. But he obviously different life, different world, different circumstances and opportunities. And he moved in a very different direction, but that passion was always there. And, uh, you know, my mother is a lab technologist, but she played the violin when she was young. 
So when we, we grew up on Long Island in East Meadow, East Meadow had a pretty solid, has, has a pretty solid music department. And when we were in fourth grade, we were uh, the opportunity to pick instruments that we wanted to play. And for me, I think from the beginning, I always wanted to play the violin. So, you know, because my mom had her violin here and it was like, oh, I want to learn how to play that instrument. So, you know, we started when we, when I was 10, my brother picked up the cello, like right that same summer, I think, because he was kind of yeah, interested in doing that. And so we were like, my mom and my parent, my parents were very invested in us kind of having a wide ranging education as children and as teenagers. And so they invested a lot of time and obviously money in getting us to do summer programs, getting us to do private lessons, getting us into youth orchestras um, and, you know, really maintaining that discipline. I think it was around, you know, for me personally, and I think for my brother around the same time where we kind of both had a what? change of teachers. Uh, and I started studying with, with this incredible man, Dale Stuckenbrook, the violinist. Um, and, you know, he kind of like really, he was such a wonderful, affable human being, but he was also very strict and very passionate about music. And he kind of made me realize um, the discipline of the craft of being a violinist. And I just remember that for me, it was really hard because suddenly I started feeling this intense passion for, for, for music. And it was really hard because I had to take multiple steps back to be able to progress. Um, and, you know, that training really changed everything for me. I think that's when we started to really like open up to classical music. And then from there really start to, because my, my parents took us to the opera and they took us to concerts, but we weren't really that engaged at that point in our lives. I think we were kind of didn't really, you know, we were artistic. I think we're always artistic. We love to draw. We love to, we love film, all those things. But I think that it's at 15 when I, when me and my brother started to really become passionate about classical music. And from there, it just kind of took off. And, you know, that's, I don't think without that turning point in life that we would have, you know, be here making opera wire or making movies. And yeah, I mean, music is just, yeah. I mean, the violin, it, I still play. I don't, you know, I don't think we're, we could consider ourselves professionals, but I still study. I know my brother still studies. I still teach. I have a couple of violin students that I still teach on a regular basis. So it's still very much a part of my life. Um, you know, and I, like I said, I still study and I had a performance a couple of weeks back. So, you know, I'm always open to those opportunities, but yeah. 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 I mean, for me, um, I had one, I had two teachers before my, uh, my, my last teacher, um, the first two teachers, one of them was my elementary, my, you know, my middle school teacher. And he, he kind of taught me and then I got a private, another private teacher and she was good, but I didn't feel like I was really getting or advancing to what I actually needed to do. I felt like I was being left behind compared to all of the other, other students that she had. And so I went one day and we like started looking for teachers and we got one teacher. Um, his name is George Jennifer a Russian, uh, he was the principal uh, cellist of the St. Petersburg Philharmonic back in the day. And he studied with uh, Rostropovich. And I mean, this guy came and literally uh, transformed my whole experience. One of the strictest pe person, pe people I know, but it was absolutely incredible because I got to really train in, in a way that I, I, it wasn't, I got to train really intensely. Um, and, you know, as I started to develop my, I also got to see this person who was really strict at the beginning also kind of become a much more like like a friend like a like a mentor more than a teacher so uh, i mean that for me was where where i kind of grew much more in my in my cello my, my cello studies mm -hmm. so the other question is i was going to ask it earlier but we got in a different direction <laughs> you founded opera wire at the very end of 2016 so let's say it began in 2017 Three years later, the world was hit by a pandemic, including <laughs> opera. And you had been on a path of covering all this activity and getting yourself known and, and accredited and so forth. I know some of what you did was you did a whole series of opera in the time of COVID. I was one of the people you featured. And um, how did you, what happened when suddenly all the curtains came down at once but you still had a publication you wanted to produce that was relevant to what was going on. I mean, it's crazy. I was in, oh, go ahead, friend. 
I was in Colombia and my brother and I, we, 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 I was in Colombia, March, March 12th, I'll never forget March 12th. We, we had a bunch of uh, things that we were supposed to do with different opera companies lined up. And um, my brother calls me, this happened, this canceled, this got, and I remember, I was devastated. I told David, I said, what are we gonna do? Um, but, you know, in the meantime, let's continue announcing that this company is closing, this company is closing. It was crazy. I mean, I'll never forget March 12th, 13th. Those days were very difficult times. And then they started announcing the streaming, the streams. Um, and so we started getting a lot of different things to cover and to work. And so all of a sudden, I, we had never seen traffic like we did during that time period. It was quite a quite incredible, um, and then we also had um, the fortune of also working alongside the Dallas Opera with their Dallas Opera TV. I'll let Dave talk about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the pivot was kind of uh, we were we kind of just did it in the moment because, like I said, I had no idea what was going to happen. I was like, you know, a lot of we had a lot of advertising uh, things in in play with a lot of companies, and suddenly it was like, yeah, we can't do that anymore because we're not going to have performances. So. You know, this was literally the the force majeure close in every contract, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so suddenly, yeah, my brother was like, "We're just gonna see how long we can hold out, and then we'll just we'll see what happens." You know, we, there's not much you can control in that moment. I think all of us were just feeling that same level of powerlessness. And then, yeah, then the company started pivoting to to digital performances and digital things, and. I mean, we pivoted it too, and it kind of kept us going for that extensive period of time while opera companies started to reopen. And I mean, yeah, it, it probably was not the most exciting period for opera, like <laughs> people, the opera world. But for us, there was an there was an audience that suddenly craved that and craved information about where they could watch opera. Because I think also what ends up happening is when you're in the when you're in the real world, real world, like out and about, going to opera, going to theaters, you know where to look for these things. Suddenly, all of that's gone. Where do you go? Where, where is it? Where, what's going on? What isn't going on? Uh, how much is out there, right? Uh, I think that's what a lot of people started to realize. And that's, what, that's where it was kind of like, you know, talk about traffic numbers and, and audience, building audience. We built a lot of audience during that time because I think a lot of people started to discover things that they didn't know existed before that. Just because um you know, we were discovering a bunch of things that we didn't know that existed but yeah i mean opera companies pivoted we pivoted and that's that kept us going that kept us going and i, I mean i'm happy to say that you know for us personally um because i also don't want to minimize the fact that the pandemic was very traumatic for the whole entire planet right. but for us personally it kind of did help us build a new audience that we've continued to cultivate and grow since uh now that the opera is back in in per, in, per, in person so yeah. Well, I mean, also the other thing that we did during the pandemic was we also looked at how companies were, uh, companies and singers were reacting to what was going on around the world. So, I mean, you had the George Floyd protests that were going on around the world. So for us, it was really important to also have those conversations with a lot of artists as they were, they were also having on their, uh, their, their own programs on social media. So it was important to also create and build a conversation around what was going on around the world and how opera companies were also uh deciding that they were going to to change the way that they were going to approach certain things so for us uh, how 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 the world was changing was we were also seeing we were also trying to find a, a, a balance with also the opera world because the opera world is it, yeah it's a little it can be a planet a bubble but it also lives in the real world and what happens in the real world affects um that so for us it was it was incredibly important to see, and we were also like seeing how companies, what companies were doing. Some of them were creating virtual performances. So that was a way of also getting us uh, that. I mean, uh, we were also, we have to be grateful that, uh, you know, Jennifer Rowley also, uh, we worked with her also on her, on Soprano. some master classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she gave us the opportunity to also, um, you know, teach a master class on how to yeah. film auditions because Dave, Dave was also filming auditions with, with, with his wife. And so they were, we were also constantly doing that. So, you know, we, we, we did, we were able to create a, a base and an audience and we were also able to, you know, find, find what was going on and, and try, to, and try to, to work around with what was going on in the world. As you know, um, I created this program as a response to the pandemic. I was at Covent Garden, I was working in London on March 8th 
I'd just been at Fidelio, Lisa Davidson, Jonas Kaufman, and then suddenly everything locked down. I came back to New York on March 8th of 2020, and Adagio was sort of finding itself what to do in the pandemic. I was not part of it yet. Thomas Hampson was beginning a program called Tom on Tuesdays, and I heard the alliteration. I said, if he can do Tom on Tuesdays, I can do Fred on Fridays. <laughs> and it was born on April 24th of 2020. And every Friday since then, with the help mostly of my wonderful engineer, Johan, who's listening in, but other wonderful engineers as well, um, this program has gone on. And you guys were among the first to cover it. And I, along with Fran Marshall, who wrote the article, and I was very impressed, frankly, that you picked up on it so quickly mm -hmm. because I was not advertising. I began April 24th, and I think my birthday is May 10th. I think just before my birthday, you already had an article. And that struck me that someone, despite all of the, you know, the pandemic was on top of things enough to have noticed. And so that is why, in my informed opinion, Opera Wire has become very successful because you have the musical preparation, the intelligence, the journalistic background, the news sense, but also the ethics. You're not gossipy, you're not mean, uh, but also you fact check your work. And that is why, in my opinion, Opera Wire has continued to thrive and grow. And I commend both of you for it. I'm very proud to know you both you young fellows, and, and you have a great future in this art form, whatever you want to do. Thank so you. I thank you both thank very you much for joining me today. Thank, thank you. you very much. And pleasure. readers should yeah. look for operawire, W-I-R-E dot com. And um, it's worth the time. Thank, thank you, you so all much. very much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having us. Sure. Thank you very much, Brett.